I want to talk about the the whole aspect of being saved from your sins and how complicated it seems to a relative outsider looking in to the process. Of course, I'm not an outsider in the sense that I am in Christ, in the body of Christ, 38 years along my journey heavenwards in the Holy Spirit, forgiven for my sins, consciously hearing God through the Holy Spirit, through Christ, that constant voice in the background, which is never far away, your sins are forgiven, go and sin no more. <clears throat> and immediately I know there are people out there who will shout at the screen all sorts of things about their own position of sinning and being saved by grace. Well, all I would say to you is Romans 8, verse 1, New King James Version of the Bible and other versions, but do a little Bible study <clears throat> on Romans 8, verse 1, in the context of the whole book of Romans and the whole New Testament, in the context of the Old New Testament, uh, sorry, the Old Testament of the Bible. So it's for you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So for me today, sitting in a denominational church meeting on a Sunday morning, I'm an observer. I'm not a member of that local church and its communion of its believers. It's a denominational group. Do they know Jesus? Do they love Jesus? Do they follow Jesus? That begs the question, do they know who Jesus is, was, is, and will be? Will be in the sense of the coming judge. Of course, God is ever-present. So, how can I say God will be? God doesn't change. And so, Jesus Christ, who is the judge, he was the judge of this earth 2,000 years ago. But he didn't come to judge the earth. He came to save people. He came to save everybody. Many are called, few are chosen. Okay, we're digressing into a topic that we could deal with, but we'll leave that to one side and go back to the complicated process of discovering Christ through Christianity, through denominational beliefs, and you could be part of any uh, denomination in the West, and we're talking at the West about the West at the moment because that's a it's a different place than the East and the Middle East. <clears throat> So, taking denominations with the letters A, B, C, M, U, and various letters of the alphabet, according to which particular denomination you are in, but in history, you're either part of the Anglo Protestant side of denominationalism, or you're part of the Catholic side of denominationalism. But of course, there's also ortho, ortho, orthodoxy, the Orthodox Church, which are Greek, Russian, and whosoever. <clears throat> so the process of discovering that you are a Christian begins from the moment your parents decide to have you christened sprinkled with water in certain denominations in, within Christianity. That's what they do. And so the parents say they're Christian. 
they are putting a sign on their children that they want their children to be Christians, grow up as Christians as opposed to any other religion. In some denominations, they don't have a formal christening service. They might have what's called a dedication, where they will dedicate the child to God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the real Jesus, in the real form of Christianity, if I can say it that way. And the child grows up dedicated to Jesus Christ. And they might, the parents, the Christian parents, or believers in Christ, the Christian parents might not be churchgoers themselves, but they send their children to Sunday school, which, as my uh, my mother did, single parent mother, uh, a clear believer in Christ, taught us how to pray as little children, but sent us to a denominational Sunday school, which was great. Lovely Sunday school stories, Sunday school teachers, lovely Christians teaching lovely stories about Jesus. Nothing wrong with that at all. Of course, as, as uh, the children who go to Sunday school become older, they become more conscious of who Christ is and questions come to the mind. The, the children go into the, uh, the high school of church, which is called the youth group, the youth club, the youth church on a Sunday, the youth meeting on a Sunday with a youth night during the week, which could be sport activities, as it was for me uh, as a teenager. And you start to learn things like you do in high school about life generally. But of course, the church youth club, the youth church, it's still all about Jesus Christ. There comes a point where in certain de denominations, including the, let's call it the Jewish denomination, there comes a point where the child is asked if they want to confirm the fact that they are Christian, going to a Christian church, they may or may not have been christened. And there are adult christenings that can take place, which is a form of water baptism, but it's called a sprinkling. The uh, child who becomes a teenager is, is asked, are you going to trust in Jesus Christ for the rest of your, of your life? And the answer may be yes. <clears throat> If it's yes, the child might be offered to be christened if they haven't been christened before. Or the child might be offered to be to have a confirmation, a service in front of everybody to make a declaration in front of everybody to be confirmed as a Christian within that denomination of that local church. And that is a form of coming into membership officially by your free will, you choose to become a member of that particular denomination. And that's the way it is. It's a complicated route uh, into uh, another step into Christianity, if you like. The person might be called a candidate. Now hold on to that word, because the candidate coming in to be a part of Christianity of that local church denomination, they, they, have, they, if you like, they're screened before they get into that public service to make sure that they want to follow Christianity. Now, I haven't mentioned born again. They might be born again. They might not be born again. But they are making a statement to the, the public, the members of that uh, that group on a Sunday morning that they are now saying in front of everybody, we want to be Christians as opposed to any other religion. <clears throat> and they become a denominational Christian from that particular group. And 
the leader of the group or leaders come and lay hands on that person who's called a candidate and the the person receives whatever the prayer is over that person's life and it is of course a ritual and it's biblical the laying on of hands But this, it's unclear whether the candidates are born again or believers or what their motive is joining the membership of that local denominational church. It's unclear. But they are making a declaration to be Christians. And that is their free will. And that's the way that they have chosen to do it. But more likely, that's the way that local denomination has that procedure for the next step of your Christian uh, uh, walk, if you like, journey, is for this to happen. Can be genuine. Can be genuine. Salvation comes to those who repent of their sins and they believe on the cross that Jesus died, gave his life, shed his blood as the payment for sin once and for all. And for those who believe that and genuinely repent of their sins, they are genuinely humbling themselves to God before the cross and their sins are forgiven. And the, and the journey for real begins. Now, in certain denominations, there are no procedures of christening. There's no procedure of confirmation. They don't have a procedure for anybody to be born again. <clears throat> of course, we know we're talking about John chapter 3. We're talking about verse 3 when Jesus was telling the religious Pharisee, a teacher of law, so he was saved by faith in, in the coming Christ, but he was a religious man. Not just a religious man, a teacher of the religion of Judaism in Israel, known to be a Pharisee. But he wasn't born again because he didn't understand what that term meant. So when he came to Jesus at night for fear of the colleagues in his Pharisee sect, the denomination of Pharisees, if you like, Jesus told him the truth. You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You cannot see what the kingdom of heaven is until you're born again. Of course, you take the whole context of the Gospels of what Jesus said. It's there in black and white. But when you receive the Holy Spirit, you know that every word that Jesus said was true, is true, will be true, and that you, you yourself can receive the Holy Spirit to then understand who Christ is, what he said, what he did, and what you must do to be saved from your sins. And that's not a ritual. That's not a ritual called christening. It's not a ritual called dedication. That doesn't bring you salvation. It's not confirmation. <clears throat> it's not even water baptism. Believe and be saved and be baptized. These things are rituals that man does and people go through that ritual and they become a member of that local denominational church group. But when you're born again, <clears throat> it's a direct relationship between you as a sinner and, and God's only begotten Son on the cross. And you understand that this man, Jesus, died for you in your place for your sins. And you personalize it. 
Jesus died for my personal sins so that I could go to heaven through him. <clears throat> Do I then have to stop sinning? Do I then have to obey the laws, the Ten Commandments, and all the laws of the, of the Bible? Do I have to? <clears throat> the fact is, you will. Once you're born of God, once you realize what God has done for you through Christ, and that God has forgiven you, cleansed you, cleaned out your house, set you free, the process of realization of what God has done for you increases. You're born again. Sin's forgiven. And you hear the voice of God. Now go and sin no more. And again, I know there are people out there, they will argue the point, but we're all sinners, sinners saved by grace. Somebody came up with this phrase that we are not so much sinners saved by grace, we are saints being made holy by the Holy Spirit to go and sin less and less and less and less and less and less every day. If you're not the same, if you are the same today as you were yesterday, last week, last year, then arguably you're not born of God. If your life is not changing, if you're still doing the same things you used to do, sinful things, and you claim to be of Christ, then you've got to question yourself. You've got to begin to ask some searching questions of yourself. If you believe that Christ is in you, you have the voice of God within you, the real Jesus Christ, the shepherd, the Holy Spirit, the Father, Yahweh, Yeshua Messiah. You have the Spirit of the living God living in you, speaking to you within your conscience. And you now know you're not a little child, that you now know the difference between right and wrong good and evil, good and bad. You know, know the, what the Ten Commandments means about not stealing, not lying, not coveting. You know. And you want to obey God because he died for you, gave his life for you, and that sin... crucifies Christ all over again. Now that phrase comes from Hebrews 6 and 10, Romans 6, 1 John 3, 2 Peter 2, 20 to 22. Now, you must do a Bible study for yourself on that. Yourself and in your twos and threes, come to terms with the fact that deliberate sin is crucifying Christ all over again. And eventually there is no, nothing left for you. You say that you're a Christian. You've tasted and seen how good God is directly and indirectly through his people. And if you fall away and go back to your life of sinning, it's like a dog returning to the vomit. For me, it's like going back into the advertising world and getting uh, caught up with that spirit of the world of advertising marketing, which is manipulation, which is witchcraft. And every sin is a disobedience to God. And once you know God, you've given your life to him, you've received the Holy Spirit, the scriptures start to make sense and you come under conviction you confess this and you confess that and you confess this if you confess your sins you have a god who's gracious enough to forgive you from that sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness 
and then you will hear him again say, Your sins are forgiven, go and sin no more. This is not a ritual. Taking bread and the wine or, or red grape juice or wafers on a Sunday morning from the hand of a, a clergy person, clergyman, clergyman, taking that element doesn't save you again. In fact, I would urge you not to take communion if you know you're not right with God and or with another brother or sister, you're not right with that person. Don't take, quotes, the communion. Get right with God and or with the other brother or sister and get right with them. So there is unity. Discern the body, the body of Christ. Not talking about denomination, not talking about an organization. I know these things are deep things of God, which I'm still grappling with after 38 years on this journey. These are the deep things of God. Whether to even take the communion, in quotes, we must be led by the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, I'm talking about this complicated journey of discovery, not about Christianity, but about our relationship with the Spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of our Father. God is our Father, Ephesians 4 and 5. The whole of the New Testament, the new covenant that God has placed for us, it is the small print of the terms of the agreement between God and us and us and God. Now, we didn't sign anything physically. God gave Christ for us, the Lamb of God who shed his blood. God has paid the price. And when you gave your life to God, whenever that was, properly gave your life to God, not through a sprinkling, not through a confirmation, not because a man put his hands on you and, and said some words over you. When you came to realize that really your heart was a heart of sin and that separated you from Jesus, from God, from the Father, from Jesus, from the Holy Spirit, and, and you came to terms with that truth and you said, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me, my trespasses. I want to be free of sin. I ask you, Jesus, to cast out sin from within me, my heart, my spirit, my soul, my body. I don't want there to be any sin in me, not a trace of sin in me. Jesus set me free. And the blood of the Lamb comes in to cleanse you from all sin. And you are free. And, and Christ is living in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. And that means the Father is in you because Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. So don't go running off to men calling them fathers. You don't need a so-called father priest to control and manage your life. God has given you his Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to help you with all your decisions. And he, the Holy Spirit, will give you dreams and visions. He will show you the way of Christ, the way of the Spirit, the way of Christ, the way to the Father, the narrow way, putting the past behind you, going forward in Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, to leave everything behind, everything behind, everything behind behind. Don't look back. Don't look back. Go forward. Don't be like Lot's wife, who, while she was being rescued from the coming destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the wicked evil cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, God was rescuing Lot and his family. That included his wife. 
and the instruction was, go, flee, flee evil, flee sin, and don't look back. Of course, she disobeyed. This is what sin is, disobedience to God. She looked back, and she was lost. Now, that's a warning to us. Go and sin no more. It's unequivocal. unequivocal. You cannot say you're born of God and continue to sin. Of course, there's a process of change. You, you have to look away from sin. And that means looking away from sinners who are all around you in, in a sinful context. And there are sin, some sinful contexts don't go into anymore, which they are like Satan's kingdoms. Out and out Satan kingdoms don't go there. And I'm not going to name them because you'll think, oh, judgmental, here we go. You know yourself there are areas of life not to go into. Just don't go there. We're not Jesus. We're not Jesus. There are people who, who sit in pubs and they say they're there for Christian reasons. Well, they're deceiving themselves. They go there because they like to drink alcohol. They may like to join the smokers outside and they, they like the chat and they like the spirit of the pub, which is the spirit of the world. They like the, the environment. There's no condemnation in there. People accept each other. And they justify themselves. They take their gospels into the pub and, and then drink their beers and then give the gospels out. And, and they justify that. But they've never really left the world. They've never come to that place of understanding. There are two kingdoms. And the kingdom of the pub is not the kingdom of heaven. Now you can put that into other areas. Clubs where they have strippers. Absolutely not. Why would any Christian man or woman go into a pub with strippers in? To win people to Christ? So the process of Christianity, becoming a Christian within Christianity, there are many routes into the world of Christianity. But there comes a point where you have to understand that Christianity doesn't save you. Going to church doesn't save you. Taking communion doesn't save you. Allowing people to lay hands on you and to cast things out, that doesn't save you. Satan cannot cast out Satan. So what I'm talking about here now are religious spirits cannot cast out Satan, cannot make you clean of sin. But what they're doing is laying hands on you and putting the spirit of religion on you. <clears throat> of course, let's take the Jehovah's Witnesses as, as the parable of a denomination that's gone completely wrong. And it's now known to be a, quote, Christian cult. They call themselves Christian. They have a form of Christ within their belief system, but they're not born of God. Absolutely not, because they would know they are wrong in their beliefs and their doctrines, etc., they're lovely people. They are seen by many to be more Christian than, quote, Christians, because they are moral, decently dressed, strong believers, support each other in their brotherhood, their sisterhood, and they have their <clears throat> meetings. And as long, as long as you believe everything they say, you're welcome. But if you go in there full of the Holy Spirit to start to question anybody from the ordinary members to the elders, they will soon know that you're not there to conform to the religious spirit of that particular denomination, that you, you are there for other reasons and they will exclude you, excommunicate you, shun you, 
and call you evil because you're now a non-believer of their beliefs. And that's how it is. And that's how it's been with the Jehovah's Witnesses for generations. They are who they are. But we follow Christ, the real Christ, the real Jesus. And that comes back to my recent videos about mental health, where the voices in people's heads are not Jesus Christ. The real voice of Jesus Christ is the voice that casts out all the other voices. But the person, any person who's plagued with one or two demons or a legion of demons from the past, any person must want those demons to go. And we don't manage demons. This is what the psychiatric profession does. They, they give you medication to deal with your demons, to keep the voices down. But the name of Jesus, the blood of Christ, the power of God to cast out demons and to keep them cast out, <clears throat> that is given to you once you're born again. That process has begun of of, of a complete deliverance from all evil. That is the prayer Jesus taught the disciples. He teaches us. Deliver us from evil. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, Father, within us and through us. Deliver us from all evil. And those who are delivered of evil, we are full of God, the Holy Spirit, and you can discern and distinguish the lives of those around you increasingly. <clears throat> Recently, the Lord's shown me again. He's reminded me, because we all forget things, don't we? 99.9% .9 of what I see about the life around me is just for me to know. It's an understanding. And at the same time with the understanding comes a further understanding that person doesn't want to change. <clears throat> Their mind is made up. And a person whose mind is made up, you cannot change that person's mind. Stubborn, stiff-necked, hard-hearted, they are not wanting to change, not one iota. So when you come to understand the religious spirits of Jesus' day, that religious spirit on the Pharisees was actually uh, the devil who blinded them to the truth of Christ, who Christ was at that particular time for that generation. They couldn't see who Jesus was because they were blind guides. And the same Jesus Christ is in us, the born-again believers, disciples of Christ, so when you are dealing with religious leaders, they can't see that you're of Christ. And like the ancient Pharisees of Christ's day who accused him of having demons himself, that's where they come to. The leaders of denominations who cannot accept that they're under a religious spirit and perhaps have always been under a religious spirit. So if they are right that makes everybody else wrong so again look to the jehovah's witnesses the elders of the jehovah's witnesses they believe they're right and if anybody within their so-called church questions the elders the elders will excommunicate that person well you see that sort of trait in certain christian churches it is cultic behavior. Cultic behavior. A cult works with manipulation, intimidation, domination, and to control, even using scriptures. But that's not the Spirit of Christ, not the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, not the Spirit of the Father, not the Son, not the Holy Spirit. God has given us self-control so that it's for us to control ourselves. 
99.9% of what I see about people around me now is just for me to know. But at the same time, I know they don't want to change. And so there's no conversation ensues. There's no point, no purpose, no meaning to a conversation that goes nowhere except into an argument. But God is changing us. God is changing me. God is changing them. And this is the power of prayer. And demons come out through prayer and fasting. But prayer is the beginning of it all. Jesus was in prayer all the time. He prayed without ceasing. So this is a new day. New wineskins, new wine. 18th of September, 2022. John Hammond coming to you from Norwich, UK. Please continue to pray for us as we pray for you there where you are. You are in Christ in the front line of your life where light is wanting. Jesus Christ is the light. He wants to come into people's lives. But the darkness always tries to overcome the light. But the light is shining brighter now, the light of Jesus Christ in us and through us. So read John 1, have a, have a, a meditate on that, pray into that, and realize we're not Christ, but the Spirit of Christ is in us, the light of Christ is in us, the truth of Christ is in us, the love of God is in us for whosoever. God bless you, brethren of the one God, his one church throughout this world, John Hammond coming to you from Norwich, UK. We'll talk again by the grace of God, in the will of God. God bless you.